You may have heard of a multi-level marketing company known as Rodan and Fields that claims to offer skincare solutions designed to give you the best skin of your life while becoming an entrepreneur and enjoying a flexible schedule. Yes, with Rodan and Fields, you could be your own boss. And according to their website, you don't need any prior experience. They provide the tools and support. The creators of Rodan and Fields are two dermatologists, Katie Rodan and Kathy Fields. But before they created their popular skincare MLM, they created Proactive. Proactive was created in the 1980s, and after Neutrogena refused to buy it, the doctors turned to infomercials to market their skincare line, and it soon paid off. Proactive became a household name by the early 2000s, and so did the doctors. Proactive paid celebrities anywhere from two to three million dollars a piece to market their acne line, and sales flourished. I finally decided I have nothing to lose because I tried it all. So I just decided to try Proactive. I'm Lindsay Lohan. Do you stress out about your skin? Do you freak when you break out overnight? Well, help is on the way. It's called Proactive Solution. That's why I use Proactive, because there's no way I'm going to let a bunch of zits get in my way. The two legendary dermatologists behind those memorable infomercials have revolutionized the world of skincare. Not once, but twice. After the success of Proactive, the duo started a new skincare line called Rodan and Fields. Soon after launching, Estee Lauder came knocking and they sold the company. A decision they regretted almost immediately. And then you bought it back. We did. The problem was, we had a very big vision to help people and we weren't getting there at all. We were trapped behind the glass counter completely. We just weren't their highest priority and we're never going to get anywhere. So the courage to buy it back wasn't difficult. The courage to start again with all the risk completely on our shoulders, everything we had earned from Proactive, we poured into the new venture Rodan and Fields. Although they might have dumped a lot of their own money into Rodan and Fields, what they failed to mention is they still earned 15% royalties from Proactive until they sold it for $50 million in 2016. So even if Rodan and Fields hadn't worked out, they would have still been doing okay. Typed this up on a typewriter. It still hangs in my house and I love it. And I reminds me every day of where we started. And it says, both parties share equally in the profits and expenses. There's the real kicker. All expenses over $50 must be approved by both parties prior to incurring expense. So that tells you where we started. I had two little kids and I remember thinking, we can't spend $60. I need to buy diapers. Correct. I need diapers this month. So that really, that's where it all began. We put ourselves in your shoes. We wanted a disruptive yet modern business model, offering personalized services through best-in-class digital, one that inspired confidence, collaboration, and personal growth by changing skin and changing lives. My dad always taught me, be your own boss, make your own money, and determine your own destiny. And now through Rodan and Fields, we are helping others to do just that. The business had to be worthwhile, fulfilling, and powerful. For those looking for something on the side or an alternative career path and everything in between. Everything in between. Everything in between. But wait, hold up. That all sounds really nice. And as admirable as it is for two young mothers to put their heart and soul into a new business venture, I feel it's unfair to not mention their prior privilege. You see, Katie Rodan's father was a federal appeals court judge and her mother a microbiology professor. Kathy Fields' father was a medical doctor. Both women studied at Stanford and were set up well for success. And although that should not demean their hard work, it does make me question their ethics, as it was reported in 2019 that 67% of Rodan and Fields' independent consultants earned only $304. Let's do the math on that. Because MLM companies love to say you can work part-time, I'm going to throw them a bone and do the math of only working 10 hours a week. 10 hours a week comes out to 480 hours a year. 
When you take $304 divided by 480 hours annually, that means 67% of Rodan and Fields consultants earn a little less than 63 cents per hour before taxes or cost of product. So how much do reps have to spend on product anyway? It's estimated consultants have to spend around $150 a month to be considered active and be able to earn their team bonuses. If you're familiar with the talented Britney Spears who rose to fame in 1999, then you might have heard of her mom, Lynn Spears. Lynn Spears has been a Rodan and Fields independent consultant for years. In fact, the only link on her Instagram account takes you straight to her Rodan and Fields website, where you can order product from her. I want you to listen to this audio recording I found of Lynn Spears on a business opportunity call for Rodan and Fields. Business opportunity calls are what MLM distributors do regularly in an effort to recruit new members. When I was in an MLM, we did a business opportunity call at least once a month. Hello everyone, my name is Lynn Spears and I want to welcome you to our core group call tonight. This will be a brief call telling you about Rodan and Fields Dermatology. Not only go, am I going to tell you about the amazing products that can change your skin, but this business that can change your life. But first, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a lifelong Louisiana girl. I was a teacher for 22 years while raising three wonderful children, Brian, Brittany, and Jamie Lynn. Then I retired, and then for the next decade, I helped my children to reach their career goals. Then I decided, you know what, it was time for me to find something just for me. But it had to be something that was flexible and a bit of a challenge and that would avoid my lifestyle, of course, as I am a fanatic on skincare. And I have been privileged to try the best of the best because my two famous daughters, they're given so many things all the time by companies. But anyway, but they'd already hit a home run with this company, so I knew they were going to knock it out of the park with ADH because the ADMH market is so much bigger. It's 3.2 billion and rising. So, and that's in the United States alone, people. So, even with our depressed economy, by the way. So, anyway, I decided to jump in, jump on board. I jumped in. I was rocking and rolling for about four or five months and doing really, really well, building my dream team, made my investment back. So, Brittany calls me and says, Mom, I'm going on a seven month world tour and I need you to tutor the boys. So, I did. But guess what? At the end of the tour, not only did I have the most amazing skin of my life, but my business had actually grown even bigger while I was away. So you know what? This proved to me this is a flexible, extremely lucrative, innovative virtual enterprise. I don't deny Rodan and Fields has good skincare or that the doctors don't know what they're doing. They obviously do and are brilliant dermatologists. But just like the doctors, the thing that bothers me about Lynn Spears' opportunity call is she is denying her own privilege. Lynn Spears is a celebrity, meaning her network is vast and wide. She will have no shortage of recruits. So to make her team believe that they can recruit and live the lifestyle of their dreams is highly misleading, especially saying she went on tour for over half a year and when she came back, her business had grown bigger than ever. This implies to her network that you don't need to do much. Your business will grow on its own. After all, once you are deep inside an MLM, you are constantly told to friend request anybody and everybody and to put your own money into running ads for your business because as they say, your network is your net worth. Just as an FYI, I will be deleting any hateful comments about the legendary Britney Spears. She's a human! That is not what this channel is about. Let's be nice. Leave Britney alone! Some people tell me, Josie, it's not fair to report the low earnings from the income disclosure statements when so many people sign up only for the discount on product. Believe me, I know this argument well because I used to use it myself during my five and a half years in the MLM industry. But here's why I disagree with that now. Every person who signs up as an MLM independent distributor is groomed and recruited with the intent to become a business owner. 
not just a customer who gets the discount. It's why new distributors can't sign up without first giving over their social security number to the company. The company intends for you to sell their product, and when you do, they'll have your information ready to hand over to the IRS come tax season. And having been in the top 1% of three different companies and witnessing many, many teams other than just my own, I do not believe the FTC statistics or the income disclosure statement numbers to be skewed. I saw how many people succeeded and failed. MLMs are one of the most predatory industries out there, and I won't even slightly begin to defend them. I can confidently say I am not surprised by anything you are about to hear in this secret interview with a woman we'll call Jane Doe. She earned seven figures in Rodan and Fields and walked away with the promise to never step foot in the MLM industry ever again. It doesn't matter if a person has been at the top or the bottom of the pyramid, MLMs negatively impact people's lives in a way they never expected. Please note if the audio in this interview sounds off or slightly robotic, that's by design. I did my best to make her voice understandable for my viewers while changing her natural sound, because when she quit Rodan and Fields, they made her sign a contract saying she couldn't speak out about the company for one full year or they would sue her. Yes, Katie Rodan and Kathy Fields, who are now worth $1.5 billion each, that's billion with a B, make some of their independent consultants sign contracts with Rodan and Fields and threaten them with a lawsuit. I wish I could say this is abnormal behavior from an MLM company, but witnessing what I saw from the top, I can tell you it's not. In this interview, our Rodan and Fields Jane Doe decided not to be the good girl and speak out. This is her story as told to me. And as we say, skin, it's a beautiful thing. And fellow Wrinkle Warriors, you certainly wear it well. well. Okay, so I am here with my Rodan and Fields, Jane Doe. Welcome. Thank you for having me. And I want everyone to know, like, before this started, she was very nervous. She was like, can you change my voice? I have to be blurred out. Tell us what's going on, why you have to be anonymous. Um, you said something about a contract to me. Talk to me about that. So I signed a non-disclosure agreement um, as an RFX leader. And so basically anything that I talk about at all about the company apparently violates that, even though it really is free speech and my experience. Um, but, you know, I don't want to get sued either. So I'm just going to protect myself for now until I know that I don't need to. And um, so I just want to get the information out there, but I'll protect myself. Absolutely. I don't think a lot of people who are on the outside of the MLM world or who haven't been near the top, I don't think they understand just how malicious it can get from the CEOs, from the top of the pyramid. And I saw so many people, distributors get sued or the MLM go after them when they would leave to go to another company or just when they would walk away from it. And that was another reason, just one more thing. Uh, that caused me to walk away because I was like, this is scary. Like what? <laughs> I saw a lot of people get sued. Yeah. It's absolutely frightening. So tell our viewers a little bit about your story. Um, what caused you to reach out and want to do this interview and how did you get started in Rodan and Fields and when? So I got started with Rodan and Fields in early 2014 and like most people who start, it's a friend who recommended it or a Facebook post they saw and, and genuine interest. The products looked good and I had a genuine interest. I needed new products. Um, a friend met with me over wine and yeah, I thought the products looked great. I thought, yeah, I'll try some, try some of your stuff. I think it'll be good. And she talked a little bit about the business. I was like, eh, that's like Mary Kay parties. I'm not interested. And I didn't really know much about direct sales at all. And she talked about how the products had been in Nordstrom, which they had prior to the company going to track sales. So I thought, oh, well, you know, it must be legit, right? So it made me think I really want to try these. 
And when I got home, she had mentioned how the consultant kits were such a good deal and you get a tax write-off and blah, 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 blah. And I thought, well, if I want to try stuff, I just want to get everything. So I bought the kit thinking, I'm not going to necessarily be a consultant. I want all the things. And really, I feel like I was an easy target. I was a mom. I was, you know, was kind of in this rut. And I'm still a mom, but, you know, I was a mom with younger kids and, you know, didn't really have a way to like go back to work. And I thought this would be like the perfect solution. I can get my products, maybe make a little money. So I didn't have huge expectations going in, but that's kind of how I got in the door. Mm, It always starts small. And Mm -hmm. it's never from like, you know, some creepy snake oil con man on the corner. It's always through a best friend or a family member or a coworker. And it starts out innocently. It really, really does. So tell us uh, what ended up happening in while you were in the business. How uh, successful did you become? Um, What was the beginning like? So my area where I live really had, you know, I hadn't even really heard of Rodana Fields other than this one friend. Um, She lives in a different state. And so I kind of thought, well, this is great. I can introduce it to my friends. And so really I just started using the products and I had a party. People came and it was, it was what they said would happen. What my friend told me would happen. People will come. They'll love the products. They sell themselves. Right. And really they did like that first party I had, they did. I was like, wow, look at all this all these sales that I'm making, these people love it. A few people joined, brought the business kits themselves because I did. And, you know, I talked about what I did and people did what I did. And then I got my first paycheck. I was like, wow. And it was like $700 or something. And I thought, well, I went from making $0 to making $700 in in one month. That's really great. And I just kept doing that. I got more people on board. And really for me, it was easy because I was really the first one in the area. And I started getting you know, the products, I really did genuinely like the products. Um, so it was an easy sell for me. I was getting a paycheck. I was getting recognition. I got love bombs from everybody. I was earning gifts. I was earning trips. And this was like for the first time in a really long time after going years, not getting a paycheck and no accolades for anything other than, you know, a Mother's Day card from your kid, which is great. But, you know, it's just a different thing. Um, and so for me, it took off very quickly. But I noticed that for others that I was bringing in, they were not. Yeah. And what did they tell you when you told your upline or whoever, your mentor, that like, hey, how do I get my team to where I am? Because they're trying really hard. It's not working as well for them. Because for me, what I found is that just like you, nobody was doing those things when I joined my first one in 2013. Uh, no, I didn't even really know anybody personally who had ever been a part of an MLM. I didn't even really understand what an MLM was. And I jumped in like you. I was like, okay, let's just try this for fun. I'll try it. See if it works. See if I can make some money. I already love the product. And I've also used Rodan and Field products before. And uh, yeah, they're good products. Like there are good products in an MLM. So it's easy to get sucked in, especially if you love the product. And you know, before I knew it, like I was all in and and I was making money because I had a larger network and it was a brand new thing um, to my network. So the fact that I was making money from it and doing what they said to do, and then I made money, it just reinforced that like, oh, what they're telling me works. You know, I wasn't aware of the stats that 99.4% of people lose money. I wasn't aware of all those things. So what happened when you talked to your mentor and said like, how do I get my team to succeed? Mm-hmm. So it, I noticed it started being harder and harder. You know, the first two or three women who joined me, they built pretty quickly too. They, they started bringing people on too, but as it got bigger and bigger and more saturated, which I, I talked to it was blue in the face about how saturation wasn't real. It is. It totally is. Um, another one of those things that I've had to relearn. Right. Um, but I, I truly believe, truly believe that the people who weren't succeeding just weren't working hard enough. And even, and, and if I told them, you know, what to do, I regurgitated what my upline told me. I told them what I did. Well, if you do these things, you will be successful. I just assumed they must not be doing those things. I really, truly believe they must not be working as hard. But, but when I got to that top level, and I got there pretty quickly in less, you know, less than a few years, I got to that RFX, that like top tier. 
I started noticing, you know, I got a peek behind the curtain. And I noticed that it wasn't just me, that all of these other people at the top had all these other people beneath them who weren't succeeding, who weren't hitting the top. And you think if this is really duplicable, that word that's thrown around all the time, people are doing what they say they're doing, this should be happening for everybody. And, and that was not what was happening. Um, the people at the top literally weren't doing anything. They weren't, they were just collecting a check. They were collecting a check and telling the people at the bottom what to do. You know, I started, I started seeing kind of the ugliness there and, and I was still working at that point, really. I was still doing all those things. And then I started realizing, gosh, you know, this, this doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem right. Like I'm selling this dream that I've earned. Nobody else is, is earning the dream. What's happening here? Interesting. And how long were you in and what was your highest financial level that you reached? Um, so I was, I, I was a million dollar earner. So I reached the tippity top. Um, and so it was, it was my, in my third year when I hit the top level and it was really right at that point that I, I started not liking what I saw and it took me another two years to get out because I kept looking for validation that maybe I was wrong, maybe this was okay. Um, but you know, the company started announcing changes all the time to the comp plans. And I thought, well, this is weird. Like why are you making it harder to attain if, if the company is doing so well and all these people are working so hard, why are you making the titles harder to obtain? So I, I started seeing those things that I was warned about and ignored at first. And Again, I just I realized that I was selling a dream that didn't exist anymore, and I was asking to, to I was being asked to speak in trainings and um, at convention and regurgitate all these things that I no longer believed. And it was really at that point that I, I just had to walk away. Didn't you get so exhausted of constantly regurgitating all these things in during trainings that you had said a million times, and you're you're just like, okay, I, I don't know how much more I can say this until I'm blue in the face. Exhausting. Exhausting. And then especially when you start to realize that the things you've been regurgitating really aren't true, that it's just what the company has told you to say. And that feeling of, oh my God, I can't believe I believed this bullshit, first of all, because it worked for me. Um, but just because something works doesn't mean it's good. That's just one thing I've learned too. Like just, you know, just because you go on the diet of water and you lose weight doesn't mean it's good for you. Like that's the thing I keep saying. And it, it doesn't mean that it works for everybody. And in fact, it works for almost no one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I found that too, when I walked away, I had, for the most part, the people were so supportive of me when I came out of the anti-MLM closet, but there were a few who were like, if you were really making that kind of money, you wouldn't have walked away. And I'm like, there are some things that are not worth the money. And I say that mm -hmm. as somebody who has half her family in a third world country, you know, I don't take that lightly. Um, I know that we're very privileged here in the U.S., but there's a lot of people hurting and homelessness is a real thing. So I don't say that as just like, oh, you can get money elsewhere. It's easy to find. I say that as there are absolutely some things that are so soul draining, life sucking and corrupt that are not worth the money at all. Yeah, it's like being with an abusive boyfriend, honestly. That's like the best thing I can attribute it to. It's not worth it. Absolutely. It's definitely an abusive relationship. Um, and I noticed the same thing like you were saying, because it's funny that it happened in your third year. You started to have those aha moments because it was my third year too, that things started changing. Our comp plan also um, changed a little bit. We lost like 60% of our income and I'm like looking around like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And when we would ask the company why these things were happening, how are you going to compensate us and make up for what we've lost so we can help our teams and continue to thrive. It was, oh, nothing's changed. You just need to work harder. You need to work harder. So then you doubt yourself and you're, you know, you're completely gaslit and you're just like, okay, is it me? Am I the one? Like, maybe I just need to try harder. Maybe I need more self-help. Yeah. Or you just don't have belief. Let's get your belief back. You've lost belief. And you know, that's one thing that happened to me too when I was considering leaving it. And it was like obvious that not just me, there were lots of top leaders who were starting to lose belief and starting to kind of see their teams weren't working. They were losing people at other companies. And then they'd like fly us somewhere to have like a meeting, you know, a, 
a leader's meeting, like to make us feel, first of all, you're important. We want to hear from you. None of the stuff we said did anything or changed anything, but it was almost like they were just paying us off, like buying our loyalty. Um, and it was just gross. Like I just felt gross about the whole thing. That's interesting. Buying your loyalty. Cause I was a six figure earner, but they weren't doing that to the six figure earner. They were like, Hey, let's take you to Bora Bora randomly. Things like that. Like we would earn trips, but it was never like that. But I did see top leaders who were seven figure earners. Cause my upline in both companies were seven figure earners. And I noticed a lot in the second one, or excuse me, my last one, which is my third one, which was having a lot of issues. Uh, they were flying them out randomly to the CEO's mansion and having these like mini retreats for like the very, very top 12 girls. And it, mm -hmm. it was just kind of bizarre. It was interesting, but you know, they want you to show that to your team and say, look, you can be here too. Yes. You become the, the guru like the person to strive for and they do anything to keep you in in that place like the um you know again having you train for things having you be on team calls you become this person that other people are like oh i can't wait to be up there i mean at convention i would have people lined up to get a photo with me and i and i just thought what the hell is wrong with you people? Like, why, why are you doing this? Even then, even though I was kind of like, wow, this is cool. It was also like, but wait, what, what are they, what, what is so important about what I'm doing? Could I make more money? You know, that's why they throw us up on stage and have us like a freaking beauty pageant. It's, they, they make this, that they want people to work so hard, even though they know it's unattainable for 99% of people. And so they put the people on the top out front for everyone to see and worship. And it, it's, it's a total lie. It, yeah, it absolutely is. And my uplines um, from my first and third company, I would see them when we would go to convention or summit or seminar, whatever you want to call it. It's always their annual big event that they have every year. And I would see literally like a mile long line of people waiting to get a picture with them. And it was just, I call it the Tom Cruise day of Scientology. Like that's what it was like. They're, they're idolized in this group, this cult. They're the Tom Cruise of the cult. Like <laughs> that's what it was like. And it, it does because you like, they get this God complex, this huge ego, a lot of them. Um, yeah, it's for me, I, I became really tired of recruiting to fail. And I've had people ask like, well, why didn't you just walk away? when you, when it started to get hard, when you started to wake up and it was because you're trained that if you walk away, then your failure, it's all on you. And not only are you mm -hmm. failing yourself, you're failing your entire team. So you're letting down all these people, which makes, if you're not, you know, a complete narcissist, it makes you feel horrible. I mean, I mean, it just, it, it eats you up inside. And so for me, I was like, Nope. I just need to work harder. I need to study more I, or I need to find a new company with a nice CEO that cares about the distributors. I hadn't yet realized it was the entire industry that was so messed up. So what was it like when you started to walk away? How did that go for you? So I just got to the point where I was embarrassed being associated with the company. And, and it was very ironic because like what you said about, you know, you had to, you had to say, even when you wanted to leave, you can't. It's like, what's that Hotel California song? Like, you, you can check out any time you want, but you can never leave. You know, you can stop working. You can just stop and stop collecting, keep collecting a check and stop, but you'll get shamed by your offline and by the, you know, directors or whatever, because you're not working and your team's watching you and you're failing your team because you're not working. But if you walk away, you're a failure. Like, you're in no, you, you cannot make a good decision at that point. And so, you know, I, I just got to the point where I said, I can't do this anymore. And I don't want to make a big deal out of everything. But I had been deleting all of my Rodana Field stuff from social media. I was untagging myself and stuff. I closed, I removed myself from everything, deleted everything. Um, I turned off my team page and, you know, I, I, I did everything. And I told my sponsor that I was walking away. And she was a friend, you know, she is a friend, still is. Um, and she also, she feels the same way I do. But because you know i wasn't the breadwinner like yes we made a lot more money when i was doing rodana fields and it was great but my husband was always still working thank god i never retired my husband i hate that phrase but 
my upline who got me and she was the breadwinner, the breadwinner. And so she really is stuck where she feels all the things I feel and cannot walk away. Um, you know, the only bonus is that when I did walk away, her paycheck went up a little bit. So I feel like, you know, if that's the least I can do, which is such a, like, that's another, like, ah, that totally screws with your mind. But, um, you know, once I realized it was all about recruiting, um, you know, again, the people at the top are making money off the backs of others. You know, you're told you're in business for yourself, but you're not alone. You know, you're in business for yourself, recruit and replace, recruit and replace. Like, in, and on one hand, you're told to just, you're in it for yourself. If one person says no, go to the next person. But yet you're still supposed to carry everyone with you. And if you fail, you failed them. And it's such a total mind fuck, you know? Um, and nothing lined up. And, and to be honest, like there are people who don't even know that I left the company yet. And it's been almost, it's been a year um, because I didn't want the drama. I, I just wanted to quietly walk away. I just, I just didn't want to be involved anymore. Oh yeah. Nobody ever wants to shout that out unless they are shouting it out to recruit to, go to, their to new another company. company. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's how it always works. And I don't know, like looking back, I'm so surprised that I never made one of those videos about like, oh, why I left Beachbody or oh, why I left such and such company? Because I knew that 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 works. That's a very strong and good recruitment tool. I don't think it's ethical, but mm -hmm. it works. And it works because once that distributor, the top distributor walks away and goes to another company, they can say, here's what's wrong in the last company. And this is why this one's so much better and it, why it doesn't do any of those things and why you should join me. The comp plan's better. It's more community, yada, yada, yada. So it does work. And I think there was something in me when I left my other companies, I was, I was scared because I was like starting to distrust things. But like I said, I still hadn't realized it was the whole industry yet. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, let me go to this new company and see how that goes. And I just, I never ended up making any of those videos of like, oh, why I left such and such company, come with me to this one. I never did, even though I knew it was an effective strategy. I just was like, something, something's not sitting right in me. I just need to first see how things go. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's very interesting, like you said, how they're contradictory where they tell you um, you're in business for yourself you know, your 1099 contract worker, this is completely on you. Um, but you also are responsible for your team. You need to be there for your team. You need to help uplift your team. Your success is my ex upline used to say like, Oh, your success is a mirror or whatever to how many people, a reflection of how yeah. many people you've helped. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So or a, a rising tide lifts all boats and what is all the other crap that they, they throw down the throat. Yeah. Same thing. So it's very contradictory and it can be very hard to walk away because you're like, oh no, I'm failing all these people. But I did notice that's a great thing. You did not pr like bring your husband home, you know, try and retire him with that income because I saw my ex upline do that in my last company. And you know, that's a recruiting tactic they love to use because it's another one that works like, Oh, look, we're making this much money that my husband doesn't have to go to a job. He hates anymore every day. And mm -hmm. then she told me in private at our retreat that, uh, you know, like things weren't going as well anymore with the company and he was looking for work again. He was meeting with his old boss that week to have coffee so that they could talk. And it's just, that's scary. That's really, really, really scary. Oh yeah. The leaders I know who had, because there was a great growth trajectory. And of course you get in at the right time and so oh, every MLM will tell you it's not about timing. It's not about timing. Oh, unless it's new, then, oh, it's ground floor. And it's all about timing. It's like, you'll hear a different thing on a different day from a different company. But I really got in and had the right market where there wasn't anybody here doing it. And and I had a lot of leaders in my upline who did retire their husbands and they are all back working again. And now that the company has apparently just removed another line of pay. So, you know, some of these leaders who were making, you know, a million dollars a month or whatever, you know, now that like their paychecks are cut in half. So it's just, it's like the writing's on the wall, but you're told it's that confirmation bias that you want it, you want to believe it so badly that this is true and this is the way to do it, that you will not look at rational actual facts and I did it for three years like I I did trainings on objections that are true but would talk 
talk my way around them and teach other people how to do the same thing. And oh, we're not a pyramid scheme because pyramid schemes are illegal. Like that doesn't matter. That's like saying I'm not a thief because you didn't catch me robbing the bank. Like you just didn't get caught. Like the, these companies just aren't getting caught and maybe they're cutting corners and maybe they're doing something to make it not illegal. But make no mistake, these are all pyramid schemes. They're all pyramid schemes. I don't care if you're selling product. I don't care what product you're selling. It is all about recruiting people. And they hide behind the fact that the people have to buy product when they join. But it's all about recruiting. There was not one person at the top who got there by selling eye cream. <laughs> right. You get there by building a team. And actually, according to the FTC.gov's website, a study on their, uh, the case, it's called the case for and against uh, network marketing. It talks about how you actually have a higher chance of earning money in a pyramid scheme than you do an MLM, mm. which is crazy. So they're actually worse than pyramid schemes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because you're pretty much guaranteed to make money in a pyramid scheme. I mean, you'll go to jail immediately. But, um, but yeah, with an MLM, you just don't know. Yeah. And so, so a lot of people don't know that you left. Uh, I'm happy that you're still friends with your ex upline because, you know, I went through a thing where, I mean, I was completely shunned. I was a suppressive person. And <laughs> so what mm -hmm. happened? Did anybody uh, say anything to you when you left or what happened there? So it's funny that you should mention the people do the, you know, I'm leaving and going to a new company because most of the people who have reached out to me, like, hey, I noticed you don't post about our NAC anymore, which I hadn't been for a couple of years, honestly. Like this period was really long where I just stopped, um, but I was still enrolled technically. Um, and, you know, I would just say, no, I'm just going behind the scenes. But the people who have reached out have been like, because I'm not wondering, because I've got this great opportunity, you know, now if. Um, oh God, what is it? It's savvy. It's uh, athletic wear, which God, how many leggings can you own? Um, you know, it's this protein drink. It's the uh, some water system. It's what's the other thing? Um, that I, I've been reached out to by all these new and up and coming and ground floor. And blah, blah, blah. It's the same thing. And they jumped from one to another. And so they're still in that brainwash mode. Um, so I've been reached out by those people. And then other than my direct upline, who, you know, we were friends before, basically the people who I was friends with before, who became part of the company because we were friends, we're still friends, um, whether they're in or not, right? Because the, the, the pull was the friendship, not the skincare. People who I met with the exception of a couple of people who ironically are not in the company anymore, the people I met through the company won't speak to me anymore. We're just fine, like, that's fine. You know, most of my upline, uh, you know, I'm a trader. I'm, I failed my team. Um, you know, I didn't have belief. I don't have integrity, you know, whatever. basically all the fake friendships and love bombing was all fake. It's so conditional. And that was what was so painful to me. Maybe it's because I'm a Sagittarius or who knows, but I'm just an extremely loyal person when it comes to my friends and friendships really important to me. And to just be like, bam, it was like a light turned off. And instantly, like, they were all gone. And, I mean, it, that was just mind-blowing to me. It, I couldn't believe it. So I'm still glad you're friends with your upline. Uh, <laughs> that's a good thing. So what made you not join another one? Was If R&F, was it your first one? It was my first one, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think I got in because I didn't really understand direct sales. But by the end, I understood it. And I would not join another MLM if you held a gun to my head. Like, no. Yeah, I feel the exact same way. I, I can't touch it. Cannot even go there. And it's interesting because for me, I don't know about you, but when I walked away, I had to work really hard to not try and go back to another MLM. I would tell my husband, don't let me join another MLM. Like, don't let me do it <laughs> because I, it was, I don't say like in a sense addicting, but knowing that I had made money, knowing how successful I had been and missing that recognition and all that love bombing and that feeling of community, that was what was really hard. And I was like, man, I really, really missed that. And I just found myself constantly having to coach myself mentally and be like, Josie, it's all fake. It's all conditional. Mm -hmm. It's not real. Did you find yourself yeah. having to do that? For sure. And I think it's recognizing that, like the abuse of boyfriends, it is okay to miss something, even if it was toxic. Like there's things I totally missed about it. There were, I mean, I had some great trips, some great times, some great memories, 
all that stuff was true. It just came at a big price that I wasn't willing to pay anymore. Um, and I still have those good memories. Um, I still have all that. So I think it's okay to acknowledge, yeah, I missed that stuff, but joining another MLM would not make it better, would not bring it back, would not be, you know, no, nothing is worth it. Nothing is worth joining another MLM for. Not at all. And that's sometimes I think what people who have never been in an MLM don't understand is because I would always get that like, well, if it was so bad, why didn't you just leave? You know, um, it, it is like an abusive relationship, 100%. And I say that as somebody who left an abusive marriage over a decade ago, it's hard to leave because it's not all bad. So when there are some good times, you're like, oh, see, this is good. They do care. Or, oh, it's, you know, it's going to get better. <laughs> and it, it just, that's not how it works. It just doesn't. And so I think people are afraid to leave things, whether it's abusive companies, high control organization groups, or uh, relationships, because it's not all bad, but it's just a delusion they're telling themselves. Yeah, and I think that's why the company, why they have mid-year, uh, you know, whether it's convention or a summit, they have these things to constantly keep you up, right? To keep you like, oh gosh, I haven't sold anything since last convention. Oh, but take me somewhere and give me a fun swag bag and I'm going to be with all my friends. There'll be pictures and music and lights and it'll be so cool. It's like a concert. It's like, it's enough to keep you going, not making any money for another year. And, and convention after convention after convention, the same people would come who just wanted it so bad and they hadn't promoted at all. They were still not making any money. All the money they saved, they spent on convention. And, you know, it's got to the point where I'm like, this is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And in a real company, they're going to pay for your trip. They're going to pay for your continued education. And that's not how it is in an MLM. You have to fork out money for everything. And they also prey on your emotions at these events or even when you're at private retreats with your team. I mean, because from what I noticed, like we were sharing really deep things with one another, you know, sharing our hardship, sharing things we had to overcome. And it makes you feel so connected to these people that you're like, oh no, they could never do me wrong. And they're believing what the company is saying that they could never do you wrong. And then you go to these events and you get hyped and you're like, okay, you know, I was just in a dark place. I just need to continue. I need to work harder. And it's so insidious. It's very, very insidious. That was one thing they actually encouraged when, when you were preparing to train for convention or preparing to train for a you know, a company-wide call or something is have a story, a tear-jerking story. And now looking back, like that's so, that's such a dirty tactic because, you know, you got to put just your heart and soul out there to get other people to believe in something that still doesn't exist, sad story or not. Like it's, that is such a tactic. And yeah, thinking about it, like that was something they taught for sure. Absolutely. And I noticed that the conventions, it was always the same people speaking on stage, even at like the mini trainings that they would do during the day before the big nightly one. It was always the same people leading the trainings, doing all the workshops. And I'm like, when are they going to bring some new successful people in? And I didn't realize at the time, like, oh, there really aren't a, many new successful people. Yep, it's all the same people making money off of all of you who are paying to be here. Yeah, yep. it's crazy. So did you make seven figures a year or did you make seven figures of your time in it? I made seven figures of my time in it. And you made that by your third year? Yeah. That's a lot of money. How was yours and your husband's life affected uh, when you walked away and do you have, you know, you said you have children. So yeah. How was your family's mm -hmm. life affected when you walked away? Cause I know that's not easy. And I know from being mm -hmm. in the top that income can be very enticing and yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, what's funny about that is the more money I made, I felt like it was more money I had to spend with Rodan and Fields. And honestly, I'm still to this day, like going through my closet, even for the things that I had to buy, like these ball gowns and these super expensive designer shoes, shoes that the company doesn't tell you you need, but it's like you have to meet this, you know, standard to be a leader and you have to inspire and you want to have your best foot out there and like this diamond jewelry and these watches and all of the stuff that 
I spent a lot of money. I spent a lot of money on my team because you got to keep people motivated. You got to keep people in. You know, the company spoiled me. So I got to spoil my team. The trips we took, of course, you take a trip, you know, you're going to stay a little longer. So you spend hotel on yourself. You, you know, spend more on food. You got to get a nanny the whole time. I was working more. And so I ended up getting a nanny, which I didn't have before. I was a stay at home mom. My expenses went through the roof. And then not to mention taxes, which I know you've talked about this before, about having to do quarterlies. We also got slapped with a fine from the IRS because I didn't know at what point I needed to do that, which over a certain income level. And I, you know, luckily my husband's, you know, smarter financially than I am. I give him all the credit there. But, you know, we did save some because he's like, you know, this is contract. They're not paying taxes out, honey. Like, oh, yeah. you know, I hadn't had a job in years, years. And so, I mean, our taxes were super high. So the tax benefits, when they, when they talk about tax benefits, it's like, don't talk to me about tax benefits unless you're going to tell me, at least give me more advice, like consult an accountant or when you make a certain amount, maybe you should talk to an accountant. These are not, nobody in an MLM is vetted. I wasn't vetted. I wasn't interviewed to see if I had any financial knowledge. Luckily, I had a husband who we have a good accountant. Like, <laughs> that's the only thing that saved me. So, yes, we did buy more, spend more. We could do more things. But our expenses went through the roof. So, honestly, by the time I by the time I walked away, I had enough time where I knew I did not want to do this anymore and just didn't know how. I just didn't know what to do that we, we brought our expenses way down. And... And so luckily, I mean, that, that was ideal. It's like we never got to the point where we relied on my income. It was always just extra fun money. That's good. Yeah, I the tax thing threw me for a loop. And even like you said, you hadn't been working. I had been working. I was a hairstylist who was a 1099 contractor for seven years. I did my taxes every year. Never, ever had I known that if you make a certain amount, you have to file quarterlies or you're charged fines, penalties, and an interest for the time that you weren't paying penalties. I mean, it was a huge fine. And I was just like, oh my gosh. And I'll see a lot of people who are in the MLM industry comment on my videos and they're like, who doesn't know to pay their taxes? You're stupid. <laughs> Don't even act like you would have known to pay quarterly tax. Give me a break. Unless you have that type of financial training that most people don't. Like they don't teach it to us in school. You know, it was just, you don't know what you don't know. And it's crazy to me in retrospect, looking back at all the information they shoved down our throats with the self-help, the motivation, the sales trainings, all the BS. And yet they never offer financial guidance. Never, never, or even a suggestion of what book to read. Like, obviously, they can't give tax advice. I get that. I get that. But just say, maybe consult my captain. <laughs> like, maybe you should read this book here. Yeah, they give you 10,000 other books to read, but nothing about money. And, you know, I think that's one of the most detrimental things because one thing that is sold is that, you know, gosh, who couldn't use an extra $100 a month? Who couldn't use an extra $200 a month? Sure, that's great, but that's not tax. And so you're you're having someone who's working their ass off for a hundred dollars, who's gonna at the end of the year, you know, get their ten ninety nine, and you know, not have saved money to pay for it. It it hurts the people who can't afford it, who don't have savings. And like, yeah, I got a fine. But we had savings. We had money saved up. My husband's great with money. We're we're lucky. Um, but most people are not like that. Most people get totally screwed by that at the end of the year. Yeah, you were one of the the lucky ones who had a more stable environment. Like you had somebody, like your husband, who had an income and was also able to say, like, "Hey, we need you need to have my CPA look at this. This isn't normal," you know, because I was single at the time. Like I did not. I had like a, two boyfriends during the time uh, I was in almost six years. Um, I was not married. I. I was never told by my uplines, like, you need a CPA, yada, yada, you know, you need to go do this and this, or, oh, here, look out for quarterly taxes. And when I left my first company where I earned six figures a year, um, our income had dropped by 60% that last year. That's one of the reasons I left, but also just seeing so much shady, shady behavior from the CEO. And so I was trying to work back up to what I had made 
And I wasn't even like halfway there by my last company. And like you said, we had raised our, I had raised my income to meet that level of expenditure, which is called Parkinson's law. People do that whether they're in an MLM or not. It's when you raise your expenses to meet your income and it's not smart, it's not healthy, but I had done that. And so then I was completely hurting. So last year, it was 2019 was really getting all my ducks in a row. It was really um, feeling the fall of everything, of walking away and not having had that income. Like I had to get rid of my Mercedes because I couldn't afford to keep it. Like the engine, something went wrong with the engine. I couldn't afford to fix it. I had to get rid of that. You know, I cut my expenses down over 50%. And I can't believe I did that. You know, I started doing my own nails. I still do them now. And just things like that, like things you learn how to live with less. And now where I am today, I look back and I'm like, why did I ever think that I needed to be a millionaire? Why did I think that I needed to, you know, have this crazy, huge capitalistic lifestyle that they want you to portray to people? Like what, and it just, it just goes to show that's what they indoctrinate you into believing that you need to have this lifestyle. Yeah, and nothing against designer shoes, they're beautiful, but I never had a pair before, and I collected, it was like, that that was the sign of success somehow, like designer clothes, designer shoes, I look back, at, and again, it's this idea of opulence and luxury that you have to show people, and at the end of the day, like, that's not me, that's just not me, it never was, but I had to fit that mold. And the money I spent, again, on retreats and parties at conventions, thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, and, you know, again, at convention, you're, the top leaders are offered the big rooms and the suites, and they're not paid for. You have to pay for them, but you have to, you have, to have the big suites because you're going to throw a team party, and you're going to, you have to show your team what to strive for, for in a convention with thousands and thousands of dollars every year. So I look at stuff like that, and I'm like, I, you know, no wonder our, our lifestyle, like, is the same as it was before, because I, I basically, just what you said, I, I, I brought my spending up to what I was making. And I noticed when, because they do want you to show that lifestyle, and I didn't like that either. I am somebody who, like, I will wear the same shirt for almost a decade. I'm not even playing. Yeah. Like, I hate to shop. <laughs> like, I will wear something. When I find something good, I hold on to it forever. Um, you know, I, and I felt, it doesn't mean that I don't like to look nice and what I mean, like, these are totally fake eyelashes, but I reuse them, like, 20 times. <laughs> but I, I just felt that showing that lifestyle, I didn't like it. When I bought my Mercedes, uh, cause that wasn't given to us by the company. Um, in, in my first company, I, I kept feeling like this, like they wanted me to show it, like show this lifestyle luxury, show your team what they can achieve. I think I posted my car publicly twice. That was it when I got it. And one other time, and I never did it again. Cause it just felt icky. I was like, I don't like this. Like, I don't like showing this off. Like it just felt very weird, but there are people who will do it. They will portray that influencer lifestyle and they will spend all this money and they'll, you know, take pictures of it and show it to others. And you know what? Like at the end of the day, I remember being at retreats with these seven figure per year earners and they were not happy. They were not happy. So materialism does not make you a happy person. And they were miserable with the company because it was getting harder and harder and harder the higher you went in the company. Um, it was just, yeah, it was, it was such a weird dynamic. But when people would say like, oh, you know, buy your team these nice gifts or spend all this money for a retreat. And somebody would say like, oh my gosh, this is getting really expensive. I would always hear the argument of, well, don't you want the universe to see you're serious? Don't you want the universe to, to reward you? So you need to reward your team and whatnot and put it out into the universe so that you can get that back to you. Mm -hmm. Or my leader spoiled me and I need to spoil my team. You really feel like you need to. And the company does too. Like a lot of the gifts, uh, prizes, whatever the hell you want to call them. If you hit certain sales goals, you know, it'd be like a, uh, you know, Chloe bag or, uh, you know, whatever, like a Dyson hair dryer and all this stuff that they even, they paid you in things and they paid you in trips. And by the way, with taxes, it's like you get taxed on that at the end of the year, which is another thing people don't know. And that just is shown as income. Um, but, but they make you think that this is like, if you succeed, you get these 
things and these things are good. So if you're successful, that's these things mean you're successful. If you've got the Chloe bag, you're successful. If you have the diamond necklace, you must be successful. And so you just kind of start repeating that and the gifts you give your team are representative of that too. It's, um, it's just such a gross, gross, vicious cycle. It is. And let's not even mention like the, when you are giving your team gifts, because I, the last company I was in, they did it all the time, not the company, but the uplines every single month. It was a new big gift. Like whether it was an MK bag or like you said, a Dyson hairdryer, which those are so ridiculously expensive. (laughs) Um, you know, every single month to the person who like hit their highest quota or whatever, which in that company just meant the person who front loaded the most, (laughs) who Mm -hmm. bought the most product. And I remember starting to do that with my team when I moved up higher and it was so incredibly stressful, but then also having to like tell your CPA like, oh yeah, this gift that I purchased through my business account for my business, it's um, like, how do I write it off? <laughs> it's for a giveaway for my team. Like, It's all these little tiny things that build up on you and you have to be careful with that too because the IRS will be like, mm, no, a Dyson mm-hmm. hairdryer is not <laughs> part yeah. of your expenses and by the by the way you have to send a 1099 for any of those gifts that you send you know if, they're, if it's over six hundred dollars and oh boy i didn't know any of that stuff so i didn't know it, that. It, no it gets really 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 tricky not worth it yeah don't recommend it at all oh my gosh so how is your mental and emotional state now compared to like how was it when you left and how is it now so when I, again, when I walked away, it was very quiet. And so I was I, I, a little bit on eggshells. And I mean, I still am a little on eggshells, obviously, with, you know, wanting to blur out and, you know, be anonymous, but really because I don't want to get sued. Um, but as far as being out of the company, like, I just felt this weight being lifted off me really slowly at first, month end. I mean, to not have an end of the month that was so stressful where you're calling people, making sure people are meeting their titles so you meet yours and all of that ridiculousness. You know, do I have a five orders? Because if I have four, I need to get a fifth and whatever, all these stupid rules and these caveats and what's the special this month? And did I reach out to my team? Did I reach out to my customers? And like that took so much mental energy and I didn't realize how much time I spent. Now, granted, the last year, I really was off, you know, I really wasn't doing much, but even still the mental energy and fielding phone calls and texts and all of that little busy work, (laughs) when they say like, work whenever you want, fill it in the nooks and crannies and all that bullshit, you are literally working all the time. There's never a boundary. So that was the biggest thing I felt. I felt like I got my own life back and I wasn't being interrupted and um it has been I I wish I hadn't taken so long to walk away honestly I should have done it earlier yeah and how has your was your relationship at all with your husband affected and your kids when you were in and how is that different today compared to then thankfully my husband was always very like whatever makes you happy you do this you do you whatever and he was never real involved he came along on the trips if I earned them, but he was never a guy like with his, you know, cardboard cutout. He, he wasn't a business partner. You know what I mean? Um, so luckily for him, nothing changed. It was like, I just wanted you to be happy, whatever you got to do. Um, my kids notice big time that I'm not, you know, I'm not locked in my office at month end. Like, Halloween, New Year's Eve, like those are both month end things. Like how sad for a kid to be like, sorry, mom, you know, do you want to take me trick or treating? Uh, you know, so it, it's just, I put my phone away more. <laughs> I, I don't feel as tied down. They, so they have, they have definitely noticed. It's just been positive for all of us all around. It's fabulous. I noticed too, like putting my phone down and leaving it in the other room, things I would have never done <laughs> before because yeah. you don't want to miss a sale or you don't want to miss, you know, your team reaching out to you, especially the higher you get, because the more people that 
reach out to you. I mean, you have more people reaching out to you the higher you get. And so that yeah. builds up every single day and just being able to leave it in another room and, you know, or relax on the couch and watch TV and not feel like I was being a failure because I wasn't working my business in that moment. I mean, just yeah. those little things that you don't realize it's weighing so heavily on you. Yeah. And the traveling, like all that stuff sounds so great. Like the trips to Mexico and the trips, you know, to Europe and all this stuff. That sounds great. But you're hanging out with a lot of the people who you don't really necessarily, you wouldn't hang out with normally. You're doing the things that the company wants you to do. A lot of times, again, it's this luxurious, ridiculous stuff. And sometimes it's great. But now we're, we're able to do what we want to do. And while it's less extravagant and we're not flying in first class, you know, we're also not having to stick our kids with nanny all the time. And the, the higher up I got, the more help I needed. And the less time I got to spend with my kids, which wasn't that the whole point in the first place. You're always told like, oh, you know, be your own boss, work from home around your kids. Like I had to, I had to get a nanny, you know, because we were traveling so much. And that has been the greatest thing. Is I don't have to worry about what, you know, the schedule when I go to convention. or I don't have to worry about this when I take this trip or, it just freed up so much and, and really put the importance on like the family instead of the business. Did you feel like with your time in the MLM, even when you were near the top, did you feel like you, nothing you ever did was enough? Never, never. There was, and, there, and they really felt like the company did that on purpose. Like there was always some sort of leaderboard, always some sort of competition always some sort of thing that something you were vying for and that you know there's a reason that they come out with products every six months or every year it's not because the company's innovative or we have the newest technology it's to keep you buying stuff and you have to keep and you know you need to buy this new thing that's coming out or your team's not going to buy it you need to show them you're buying it and show them you're buying four of them and it was just constantly like you're never doing enough and once you've done that thing there's going to be another thing and even if you hit that leaderboard there's going to be another one it is it's never ending and it's never enough that's how i felt with the how we were talking earlier the contradictory parts of an mlm that was another contradicting thing i noticed because they would talk to you about oh you need to better yourself you need to take time for yourself you need to set boundaries but then they were always like when? Oh, contest this week. Oh, this month is going to be this. So if you do this many sales this month, then you're going to get X, Y, and Z. It was nonstop. And if you didn't do those contests, if you didn't participate in all these things that the company was doing every single month, then you look like a failure to your team because they're saying, get your teams involved, help them make money. This is going to help your team. So you're just like, oh great. I was just about to try and relax. <laughs> mm -hmm. And now it's like, nope. Yeah, and then the um, the push to always share everything on social media, like share, you know, your offline supposed to tag you and stuff, or you, you know, my, you know, my leader got me this prize, or we're going on this trip, and I remember thinking like, oh gosh, if she is doing that for her team, I better do that for mine, or you know, even at first like, oh, how did she get that? You know, that that, that whole like team aspect where we're all working for the same company, but oh, my team's better than yours, it's better than yours, it's better than yours, and that weird dynamic of who's your offline and, oh, you know, they do that on that team or that team. Oh God, it's just gross. Like a middle school, I, I couldn't stand it. Yeah. It's mean girls stuff is exactly what it is. And that always showing that life, that lifestyle. I now, I've been, I've probably been posting more on social media since the pandemic and all the civil unrest with George Floyd happened. And I've just been like putting stuff out there, but, um, well, I should say like, BLM stuff and everything, not like my personal stuff, but just, you know, speaking more on that. But I look back on my time in the MLM industry and I was like, oh my gosh, like I had to share so much and it was constantly, like, I feel like a content farm. Like I was always having to create so much content for the month, always thinking like, okay, how many times do I need to post today? Like, just all this crazy stuff. And it is such a drain. So when I look back, uh, I've looked back, I mean, I've pretty much deleted everything now. Sometimes there's a rogue thing that pops up. But I look and I'm like, oh my God, it's so like in, inside of this, like, oh my God, I'm so embarrassed for that girl. Or if a message pops up from someone and I see that I had reached out to them and cold messaged them, I'm always like, oh my God, like it's so embarrassing. Awesome. I've had that happen so many times where like somebody will message me and I see a message from like 2015 and I'm like... <laughs> 
Oh, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> the cut, like the cut and paste cold messaging script that everybody does in every company. I just want to pick your brain. We're expanding in your area. We're, oh God, the script, you know? Gross. It's all never ending. So what would you say to somebody? What would your advice be for someone who is thinking about leaving the MLM industry, kind of feels stuck? Uh, what would you, what advice would you offer them? You know, the first thing I would say to someone is, is protect yourself. Like, what do you need right now? And look, look out in the future a little bit because I don't want to encourage anybody to quit something that's feeding their kids, right? Like if this is, this is your livelihood, just step cautiously, but know that you're not alone. Um, it's not your fault. You know, the, and I, I do feel like the more of us who speak out, like let us speak on your behalf for now. Like the more of us that speak out, the more we can like expose the reality of what it looks like of that this dream being sold is not true. I was the one who was, you know, on stage at the top of the pyramid that wasn't even success because I hated it. You know, it's collecting humans that will never succeed. Um, so in succeeding, like I, I was failing a ton of people. So that's, that's, I guess would be my advice. And if you do leave, like you're going to get called a hater, you know, you're going to get told that you didn't work hard enough. None of those things are true. None of those things are true. Um, you were sold a dream that didn't exist with these cult tactics. Um, I mean, it's the amount that I've learned about cults and how close they are to MLM is frightening. Um, so that's, that's what I would say to someone who feels these things and are starting to get a peek behind the curtain and not feeling right about where they are. I'm not saying you have to walk away, um, but just know you're not alone and it's not your fault. Yeah, that's the biggest thing, but it's not your fault because uh, that guilt you feel is strong. So in ending, speaking of cults, tell me about the toxic positivity you experienced when, how did that affect you? Oh my gosh. I mean, it really is, it's the love bombing at first, right? When you come from, you know, I was, I was home with my kids most of the time and I have friends, you know, but, but when you are just doted on and you're sent Yes, and you are told you're just so great because just because you're in this community now. Well, that's not really why. Like you're getting bought the whole time, and you know this. Maybe the sales director calls you, or so and so calls you, or you earn a trip, and and you are just you feel this validation, but all all it is is just a number. Um, and and the hardest part about that toxic positivity is that it's this constant like boss babe, boss babe, let's put up happy mantras. And if you see it, you believe it. And if you dream it, you succeed. And all this crap um, and all these positivity, these books, these gurus, you know, all these motivational things at convention. If you are told constantly that if you do this, you'll succeed. And then you don't, you do those things and you still succeed. That is so damaging to yourself. Like, it's one thing to say, you know, I really enjoy this company and I don't make much money, but it's okay, it's fun. I'm always my friends. Like, that's not allowed. You have to constantly be striving for the top. And that's really harmful for people who really just want to make a couple hundred dollars a month. Um, so I, you know, I, I started seeing how toxic it was and people start to doubt themselves. Like, I, why can you make this work and why can't I? And, you know, people are blocking me on Facebook and I feel like I'm pushing people away and my family won't talk to me. Like, you will be told over and over, oh, they're haters. They're haters. Don't listen to them. You know, they just don't see what you see. They don't, you know, you can move past it. No, like, that's not okay. That's not okay. No, not at all. I noticed when I left uh, because of all the toxic positivity and all the guilt and everything, I walked away as a shell of the person I had been. I was nowhere near as confident as I used to be. I was having trouble making decisions. I was always questioning myself. Did you experience anything like that? Yeah, you know, I feel like in a sense over the last year when I did kind of take a step back and I was just taking it in, I was able to kind of step out of that and, and see that you know what, I was regurgitating this canned content, all of these things I was selling people with, I was told to do this, and I believed it. Um, and, and I was able to be a little bit more objective about it, I think. But, um, 
but I do look at, at, at the fact that I was a vulnerable in the beginning and that's how I was sucked in. And I, and I was trained to really view everybody as a dollar sign, you know, the networking, Oh, you should network everywhere you go. Networking was just meeting someone, get, stalking their info, adding them on Facebook, and then trying to sell them something. At the end of the day, that's, that's really what it was. And, and so I had a lot of like guilt about that and a lot of shame around that and all the messages that I sent. And I recruited people who I knew maybe wouldn't, this wouldn't be right for. Um, but at the end of the day, I was sold a lie. I believed it. Other people were sold a lie. They believed it. And, and we all, you know, we have to live with our own decisions. Um, all I can do now is, is do the best I can to, again, educate people, show people, you know, apologize. Honestly, like anytime I get one of those messages where I see I have cold message somebody, I'll be like, dude, I'm so sorry for that message four years ago. I'm a different person now. Um, you know, all I can do is just go forward and like share what I know, share what I learned and, and try and be a support for someone else who is trying to leave too. That's great. When is your contract up to where you can legally speak out publicly? Um, I'm coming up. Uh, I mean, it's been a year since um, I terminated in October, so it's coming up. Okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so did they have, do they have everyone who leaves RNF sign these contracts or what's going on there? So apparently in the NDA that you sign as an RFX leader, this title I was at in the fine print, it is if you leave you know, the company or, you know, if you terminate or terminated, you know, you have a year that you can't, you know, speak publicly about the company or something like that. Basically, we can't talk for a year. Wow. So yeah. honestly, I don't think it would hold up in court. I, I don't think any of this would, but like, why, why chance it? Right. They'll still try to make your life a living hell. <laughs> mm -hmm. and that's what they do. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much, Jane Doe, for being here. I appreciate you being here. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Surprise! Yes. No way. This is a little party. <laughs> <laughs>